ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center and to tonight's program of America's Town Hall. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, which is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Uh, before we start tonight, I want to note a series of upcoming programs. On October 1st, we will launch our Constitution Drafting Project. We've commissioned three teams of the leading scholars in America, conservative, progressive, and libertarian, to draft constitutions from scratch as if they were in a state of nature. And we'll be posting their really interesting drafts next Monday, and they will convene to discuss them on October 1st. So please join us. It should be a fascinating exercise in first principles. On October 8th, Michael McConnell of Stanford Law School joins Christina Rodriguez and Adam Cox uh, to talk about uh, the book, The President and Immigration Law. And then we have Robert Putnam coming on October 15th to discuss his new book, The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. We'll be taking program, uh, questions throughout tonight's program. So please uh, put them in the Q&A box and I will ask them when appropriate. And now it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce our guest speaker. Lynn Cheney is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, she joined us long, uh, recently to discuss her superb book, James Madison, A Life Reconsidered, uh, which was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, she has been chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities and is the uh, author and co-author of 12 other books, including, uh, in addition to the Madison book, We the People, the Story of the Constitution. She's here tonight to discuss the Virginia dynasty, four presidents, and the creation of the American nation. Lynn Cheney, it's wonderful to welcome you back to the National Constitution Center. Well, it's a pleasure to be back. I look forward to, to good questions from uh, you and your audience. Uh, we always have wonderful questions from our great audience. Um, friends of the National Constitution Center, um, uh, I'd like to begin by just taking a moment to note uh, tomorrow, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg will lie mm -hmm. in state at the US Capitol, the first woman ever so honored and the second Supreme Court justice in US history and uh, uh, Lynn Cheney, I'd like to uh, invite you to just say a word of uh, remembrance. Well, she, she paved the way for women uh, to move into the workplace, to move into the academy um, in ways that no one else has. And she did it sort of quietly. Um, we always knew the uh, importance and the uh, impact of her decision but she wasn't a loud talker. Uh, she, didn't, uh, she didn't stand on the street corners with signs. She did it her own way and very quietly. And if I may say a politically incorrect thing, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, besides being a giant intellect and a, a giant uh, member of the judiciary, also had a great sense of style. And I think that's partly why young people uh, admired her and, and made tote bags that said uh, RBG on them. You know, if you look at her, she never looks quite like anyone else on the Supreme Court. She's got some fancy furbelo um, that others don't have. And when you saw her at other kinds of events, she was always dressed just a slightly exotic way. She did have her own style. And I think maybe in our politically correct times, we don't think it's okay to but comment on that, but I'll do it. I'm so glad you did. Thank you for that um, moving tribute. And as, as you and I discussed, and as um, our, some of our friends at the Constitution Center know, I had the great privilege to, to know her and to be friends with her for 30 years. And one of the many examples of her great style was she had admired a raincoat um, at uh, a, a, a visit um, that she'd made um, and, and mentioned it. And my wife, Lauren, remembered the mark and we uh, got it for her. Um, and she not only thanked us for it, but she actually had it altered and then wore it. She was just so carefully tailored and remembered every detail of every aspect of life, including the extraordinarily elegant and powerful way that she dressed. Exactly. Thank you for that. Well, um, 
there's so much to discuss in your wonderful new book, but the natural place to start is at the Constitutional Convention, because this is the Constitution Center. And what's so fascinating about your very powerful narrative is that the four founders you discuss, uh, George uh, Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe, all took different positions at the Constitutional Convention. But before we do that, I think I'll just ask you to start at the beginning and to read the, the first paragraph from your prologue uh, so that you can set the stage. Good, I'd love to do that. Um, you know, when you're a writer um, and you're writing a book, you spend a lot of time on the preface because you know that uh, a lot of people might stop there reviewers and so on. <laughs> but uh, it, it's also the first uh, chance you have to talk to uh, the reader. So it begins. Put the spike of a drawing compass into a map of Virginia at Ferry Farm, George Washington's boyhood home. Extend the other leg of the compass so that it reaches out 60 miles and draw a circle. Within it, not only Washington, but also Thomas Jefferson, James Madison and James Monroe were born, grew to manhood and made their homes. From this small expanse of land on the North American continent came four of the nation's first five presidents, a dynasty whose members led in securing independence, creating the constitution and building the Republic. One of them doubled the size of the United States. Another extended its border to the Pacific Ocean Sometimes they worked as a band of brothers, but not always. They quibbled, they quarreled, and they fought. Were political parties a bane or a boon? What were the limits of dissent? How should a republic prepare for war? So I, I wanted to begin by talking about their amazing achievements. And uh, in the book, I uh, try from time to time to address the issue of how their nearness how their being in a, a geographical place together helped influence the, uh, the greatness and uh, the achievements that uh, we remember them for. Wonderful, such an engaging way to draw all of us in in that image of them uh, all being born within 60 miles of each other it helps us concretize them and uh, makes us eager to learn more. So you noted uh, three major achievements, securing independence, creating the constitution and building the republic. Um, let's start with creating the constitution and let's, let's take, take each of your founders in turn. In your very first description of George Washington in the next paragraph, it's clear that it wasn't uh, necessarily politically incorrect to talk about Justice Ginsburg's sense of style because you note Washington's, you say tall and powerfully built he heightened his presence with elegant dress, even wearing fashionable yellow gloves on special occasions. There was something about what you call Washington's charisma. He was the most charismatic of the dynasty. That was the most important thing about his presence and conduct at the Constitutional Convention. But tell us about George Washington's role at the Constitutional Convention. Well, for the most part, he didn't say anything. And that was typical of Washington. He. Uh, he lent his presence and he didn't uh, make frivolous comments or indeed many comments at all. John Adams once said of him that Washington has the gift of silence. And I think that's a pretty important lesson for all of us in the political world or not. You know, let the situation ripen and develop before you leap in uh, to express your own ideas. So he was that presence. He also gave legitimacy to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, once Washington said he would show up, then people uh, started saying, okay, well, I will too. And it was Madison who played a large hand in, in persuading him that uh, he should be in Philadelphia in 1787. Uh, fascinating and significant that his, his mere presence uh, and, and his willingness to overcome his initial doubts about whether or not to show up were the most important thing about his role. Well, the obvious next uh, founder is Madison. He's one of what you call the two intellectuals. And at the convention, we learned from your book that Madison was less completely convinced of the wisdom of the constitution than some might've imagined. 
you know, he had worked on this for years, years and years. He began to think about constitutions and, and nation buildings, nation building while he was still um, a student at Princeton. So this was a long held interest of his. And he picked up his pace as it began to seem there might be a constitutional convention and sort of made the skeleton outline um, that would form the basis for the Virginia plan. He also, in order to make sure the constitutional convention happened, uh, rode through a snowstorm from Philadelphia to New York City to be sure that the Congress wouldn't somehow, um, somehow derail this. So he was every place all of the time, just a, a dervish um, in terms of getting the constitutional convention underway. That, that's a sometimes overlooked uh, aspect of his contribution. Of course, he had, as I say, um, really formed the basis of the Virginia plan. Um, he also spoke, I think maybe a couple of other delegates spoke more than he, but few. And he kept the notes that are our best record of the convention. He hammered out compromises. He, he was a busy, busy person and he applied a strong intellect to his tasks. But when he finished, he was not sure at all that the constitution provided for a strong enough central government. And he was in a bit of a funk for uh, several weeks. Finally though, decided that he couldn't let uh, the perfect uh, distract him from the fact that they had done what was possible and then threw himself into getting the constitution ratified. Um, it's so uh, striking to learn that. And then you describe this really important discord between uh, Madison and Thomas Jefferson over ratification. And surprisingly, you revealed Jefferson as an initial opponent of ratification, who actually sent an excerpt of a letter he wrote to Madison with his objections to the Constitution, but then he changed his mind. So tell us that amazing story. You know, it's one I didn't realize when I started the book. I've always thought that Jefferson must have been a difficult friend um, because, you know, he would do this one day and the next day have another grand idea that was in maybe the opposite direction. But I think this episode proves that indeed it was difficult to be Jefferson's friend. Madison had uh, been uh, working so hard on the convention and he, Jefferson did object. Um, Jefferson thought the Bill of Rights should be attached immediately before ratification. It was a political uh, difficulty for Madison um, that Jefferson I don't think realized if you brought up the amendments before ratification, different states would have different ideas about what the amendments would be, and you would end up with another convention. And Madison knew that was a terrible idea. So he, he dismissed Jefferson's complaint, but Jefferson uh, decided to interfere in other ways. He wrote letters to people um, at various ratifying conventions he, um, as you say, he sent uh, copies of what he had written uh, to Madison into these other conventions, trying to convince them, particularly in Virginia, to hold off, do not ratify. And then we'll get to go back and have this uh, uh, meeting of the minds about what the amendment should be. Madison understood the political peril. Jefferson had uh, no idea of it. Madison never directly challenged Jefferson or what was a, a breach of faith, surely. You know, he didn't tell Madison he was going into the legislators behind uh, Madison's back and uh, trying to stop their ratification of the constitution. But Madison did hold off on writing him for several months and uh, he was very slow to provide him with uh, a copy of the Federalist, though he finally did. Uh, again, Madison was a kind of calm, steady fellow who thought the best thing to do in terms of this conflict was to let it pass, and he was right. It's, 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 it's amazing. So, so Jefferson's initial objection was that there was no Bill of Rights, and he right. said that uh, Virginia shouldn't exceed until a declaration was added. But then you 
note that it was reading the Federalist that changed his mind. What was it in the Federalist that changed Jefferson's mind about ratification? Well, I, you know, it's hard to know what was going on in Jefferson's mind. It was so capacious and uh, so able to sustain contradiction. I think in the end, he saw where, which way the wind was blowing and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and decided that, uh, you know, this thing was going through and he should, uh, he should get on board. And the debate in the Virginia ratifying convention was really a microcosm of the debate over the country. And it was close, as you note, it was 89 to 79 in favor of ratification. It could have gone either way. And one of the prominent opponents of ratification in the Virginia ratifying convention uh, was James Monroe. So tell us about him and what were his objections? It's hard to know about Monroe. I guess it's hard to know about uh, how any human being makes decisions, but Monroe had been left off the list to attend the Constitutional Convention. And he blamed Madison, he blamed um, Edmund Randolph. And I think he was just in sort of a, a bit of a bad mood at the convention and it probably didn't decide not to uh, support ratification just because of his mood, but it probably helped things along. He, he resented not having been part of the earlier effort, the convention itself, and uh, now began to lodge powerful arguments uh, against ratification. It, it sounds in your account as if some of it was personal. You, you write that he exuded hostility toward George Washington and wrote a Lord, la, long essay at the time of the convention, the ratifying convention, to show how Washington, the statesman, had orchestrated his grand career to add brilliancy to his character and secure his success, his resignation was calculated and so forth. Where did that conflict come from? Uh, they, they had some contact during the war and to what degree was this personal? For one thing, um, Monroe was a hero at the uh, Battle of Trenton and uh, received very little recognition for it. And I think that ate away at him. He was also, because he was wounded, uh, taken out of uh, command. He didn't have uh, a force to command in the field and that, that also ate away at him. And he began to blame Washington for many things. He also blamed Washington for having uh, destroyed the career of a man named Charles Lee, uh, who was Monroe's friend and one of the few people who in the early days was very complimentary of Monroe. And Charles Lee was a pain in the neck. He uh, uh, challenged Washington to uh, court-martial him. And it was a challenge that uh, Washington uh, picked up. But this ended uh, up playing a part in the enmity of Monroe and Washington as well. And then this is something I didn't know. And it was partly because the Monroe papers had not been published in a comprehensive form though they are now almost all in that form, that uh, Monroe was the master of the unsent letter, the unsent huh. memo. And he wrote these scathing uh, essays, uh, usually directed toward Washington, and uh, it really scathing, calling uh, Washington a would-be king and someone who would um, lead the country in a dire and awful direction, and a man who was very self-centered, and who did a lot of uh, things simply to uh, uh, enhance his image. So Monroe wrote uh, this long memo and then didn't mail it. And he did that several times. He also criticized the president publicly, but the unsent memos are definitely worth looking at. The unsent memo is a virtue that we should all recommend in, in, in this uh, instant communication age. How, how, how much did personal relations, both affinities and uh, enmities, as much as philosophy shaped the relationship between these four remarkable men? Did they, did they fall in and out or were, they, were their relationships relatively stable over time? Uh, no, it changed from uh, time to time and for good reason. Uh, there was a British politician who said, um, sir, to uh, someone who addressed him, sir, when the situation changes, I change my mind. What do you do? 
And it, it's a very good question. I think helps explain a lot of what seem like inconsistencies in the uh, four members of the dynasty. One of the changes, one of the things that changed, or at least one of the things that was revealed was that Washington had a very different image for the country, very different uh, aspirations for it than the other three did. Washington, he, he was a man of the uh, uh, 18th century, you know, he died in 1799 and had, out, had outdated ideas or at least ideas that the others thought were outdated. And one of them was this, that people ought to elect the president. The uh, country's based on the people, they should elect the president and go away as soon as they had done that and leave him alone to governing. Now, this seemed insane to Madison and uh, to Jefferson, and they immediately began to think of ways to work in an organized opposition. Out of this came political parties, and out of it also came a great schism between Washington and the other three, and it, it didn't end even after Washington's death. Uh, people, uh, members of the dynasty, expressed their uh, discontent with the direction in which he had been headed. Uh, the, your account of the rise of political parties is so powerful and you have some pathbreaking and original research about the election of 1800, um, which I'd love you to share and tell us about the role of that election in creating the rise of the two parties. Well, it uh, began with uh, the fact that the Constitution allowed a sort of, I don't know, a blanket vote. You could pick from a whole field of candidates and whoever got the most votes would be uh, the, the nominee for president. Whoever got the second most would be uh, the nominee for vice president. And uh, this didn't work out very well. Um, Jefferson and uh, Aaron Burr were running on the same or they meant to be running on the same ticket, Jefferson for president and Burr for vice president. However, when, it, when the votes were counted, Jefferson had the most votes and Burr had the second most. And poor John Adams, the incumbent president, was uh, out, out of the game. The contest then began uh, with Federalist maneuvering. Both uh, Jefferson and uh, Burr were Republican. Federalists were maneuvering to see how they could get the best deal out of a bad situation. And there was a lot of uh, log rolling, I guess you used to call it, uh, a lot of conversations in corridors, trying to uh, keep the Federalists on the one hand from voting for Burr and making him president. And on the other hand, trying to get them to uh, uh, vote for Burr and uh, get a little revenge. The Federalists wouldn't have had that much power, but they would have had, they would have had their revenge. So that was sort of the beginning of the story. And then uh, to continue it, you, you learned that uh, there was a, a delegate called James Baird. And if he didn't believe that uh, the Maryland Republican Samuel Smith was Jefferson's agent, he wouldn't have gone through with this deal that had political consequences and might not have thrown the election to Jefferson in the House. You know, it's a, a story of special interest to those of us who live in uh, single representative states, that in the circumstance wherein the election is tied, if it then proceeds ahead to go to the Congress, as the Constitution um, imagines and, and ordains, if it does that, the states vote each one by one. In other words, Wyoming that has three electoral votes will have one vote in deciding the tie. And so will New York, so will Pennsylvania who have many, many more votes, but in this case are uh, forced into having a single vote to determine the outcome of the election. Um, it was a dramatic scene. There were people uh, sick who were carried on litters to the House so that they could um, cast their votes. There were nearly three dozen votes before it was over sequentially, trying to break this uh, tie. It was very difficult. And as I say, there was some 
I don't know, conversations behind the door. The idea being to uh, say, okay, the Federalists will hold off from voting if um, Jefferson will make certain concessions. Some people say he did make concessions, for example, to strengthen the Navy. Um, other people say he didn't, that he turned down pleas to uh, keep Federalists in office. The proof of the pudding is, is that he didn't do those things. But the tale uh, has been told many times that, uh, that he did. And he might have. He might have uh, put out certain hints. But in the end, he didn't act on them. It's, it's an amazing story. And it's amazing that the country survived uh, an electoral crisis that required a, a constitutional amendment to remedy. Um, does the fact that we survived that crisis and the efforts at court curbing that followed it, where the outgoing Federalists basically reduced the size of the Supreme Court by attrition to try to deny the Jeffersonians the ability to have a seat. So the fact that we survived that make you optimistic or pessimistic about our current vexations, and, and what can we learn from that election about, about our current vexations? It's always hard, isn't it, to uh, take a lesson directly from the past and say, okay, this, this shows that we should go in X direction or Y direction, but maybe there are hints, maybe there are some lessons. You know, the um, tie uh, was so, angst, it's caused so much angst and uh, people were so worried about it. And there were rumors, um, some partly true, that people in the various states were arming themselves. And uh, if the debate uh, did not end in a vote that went in the direction that they perceived best, they were gonna march on Washington. So it was not just an intellectual battle, it did take us to the very uh, core of the country and the fact that it did and that we came through is indeed a, a hopeful one. Uh, so many of the debates and uh, conflicts that we talk about and that I cover in the book, so many of them uh, have a familiar ring today. Washington had to deal with armed insurrection, for example. And he, he did it in a very strong way. He sent, he called up 13,000 militia uh, from the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area and had them converge on an area in uh, Pennsylvania where 6,000 farmers were really mad about the excise tax on whiskey and had many had armed themselves. So Washington did just, didn't go in timidly. He sent 13,000 militiamen to that spot and the uh, demonstrators, the insurgents uh, more or less melted away. So the problems are often the same. Uh, maybe it's hard to generalize, but what was it that got us through that crisis, Washington and the armed insurrection or the election of 1800? What, was it the character of the individuals or was it chance or something else? Well, uh, the character of the individuals certainly counted. Um, there are so many times when you see an intervention, you know, an event happening that, that changes the course that it you know, it makes you wonder if there wasn't some sort of uh, mild support from up above for the Americans who were uh, struggling on their way. I think it was generally a feeling. Um, it uh, built on what Washington said about this being a grand experiment and we should try to keep it. Uh, that what we were doing was noble and good and that if everyone couldn't, uh, restrain himself from making threats and uh, getting a musket, uh, then at least there would be enough people who would to move the country out of the crisis and uh, move it forward. That notion of everyone restraining themselves was so crucial to the founders notion that we had to be guided by reason rather than passion if the Republic were to survive. And you begin the book by saying that what drew these four men together was establishing a nation built on what Washington called the researches of the human mind after social happiness. What did he mean by the researches of the human mind after social happiness? Washington was self-educated, but 
this particular idea came out of his uh, acquaintance with his uh, learning about uh, the Enlightenment, the Scottish Enlightenment in particular, uh, which suggested that uh, it was possible by using reason to improve the lives of people, that it was possible by studying how men made decisions and how uh, they had built governments in the past, it was possible to find a way to build better governments that would bring um, a measure of happiness to people. I have um, long avoided discussing exactly what happiness uh, meant to them because to me, it just has such a perfect uh, aura um, in the way that we think about happiness. Contented life, a life where your, uh, where your needs are, are met sufficiently, um, a, a good life. Jefferson, I also think, liked the phrase pursuit of happiness because he was a poet and it scanned so well, you know, pursuit of happiness. And I think it would have spoiled the declaration, uh, the preamble to it, if Jefferson had said, uh, and the pursuit of property. Uh, it just, it wouldn't have had the same um, universal and transcendent impact that it does. I'd love to share an amazing experience I had on, with one, on one of our online classes recently. I mentioned before we started that the Constitution Center is teaching three times a week to a middle high school and college kids. And I noted one of the high school students asked for book recommendations. And I noted I was trying to make my way through one of the heroes of the Scottish Enlightenment to inform the founders understanding the pursuit of happiness, Francis Hutcheson's essay on the nature and conduct of the passions and affections. And I said, if, any, if anyone who's listening uh, wants to read Hutcheson and help me understand how Hutcheson balanced reason and passion, please do that. And just a few days ago, this amazing woman, a 71 year old retiree in Chicago said she read Hutchison and she thought he distinguished too sharply between reason and passion because Arist Aristotle from whom he was channeling understood that there were some reasonable and some unreasonable passions that we had to use self-restraint to overcome. I'm just sharing that with gratitude to the person who wrote in and anyone who's listening to us uh, today to, to, and is inspired by Lynn Cheney's amazing book um, and wants to, is inspired to read something, to read her book or to read Hutchison or anything else and wants to tell us what you thought, that would be great. Um, uh, so we're now, um, uh, there are lots of questions and I need to ask one that of course you uh, confront very uh, directly in the book. And that is this, does the fact that uh, these uh, men were slaveholders discredit them as some say today? Uh, and uh, how should we evaluate uh, their uh, holding of chattel slavery with the ideals that they espoused? It was a contradiction, a complete contradiction. It can't be reconciled. They knew it couldn't be reconciled. And to a man, they thought that slavery was immoral. Uh, Jefferson called it uh, a crime against God and certainly thought there would be divine retribution for a sin of such size. But they couldn't, they couldn't work their way out of this system into which they'd been born. They couldn't achieve the total emancipation that, uh, that real justice required. And so they, they had that on the one hand, but they also found themselves living in a time when people were talking about these amazing ideas, building a new society on principles like justice and equality, uh, building a new society in which the greater understanding of human nature, this is how Washington was thinking, I believe at the time, could help us build better institutions that would lead um, the people on whom the institutions should be based, that would uh, lead the people to the kind of uh, better life that uh, everyone envisioned. As it turns out, those ideals, um, freedom, equality, justice, those ideals became a very powerful weapon, weapon, if not the most important weapon in destroying slavery. You simply couldn't build a society on those ideals uh, without raising the hope for freedom and the understanding that not having equality for everyone uh, was wrong. Uh, Frederick Douglass attributed uh, the uh, Constitution's uh, 
silence on the issue of slavery um, to making it, it neutral and said, you know, if we just lived up to the words of the preamble, the nation would uh, have slavery abolished. And Lincoln admired Jefferson for having put into the uh, first part of the Declaration of Independence, the idea that all men are created equal, the idea that justice was for all. He praised Jefferson, um, praised him for putting these words at the beginning of our founding document where they could not be ignored and where they would serve as a warning to uh, anyone who didn't uh, pay attention to them. So important to emphasize as you do that both Lincoln and Frederick Douglass were inspired by Jefferson and Madison. We have at the Constitution Center, the flag that flew over Independence Hall in 1862 and Lincoln stood outside and made that famous speech saying he'd never had an idea politically that didn't stem from the De Declaration and he'd rather be assassinated on this spot is what he mm -hmm. said than abandon the principles of the Declaration. It's amazing. Huh. Well, that, I, I'm not as familiar with that speech as I should be. And uh, I'll look forward to reading more about it and uh, about the flag that uh, is among the wonderful things you've uh, collected to uh, commemorate the Constitution. Is it, is it um, important for our, um, for our friends who are watching to distinguish among the four founders in their views about slavery or did they all essentially recognize that it was immoral but nevertheless tolerate it in to more or less the same degree? Jefferson's uh, language of course was uh, uh, the language that has echoed down the generations. Um, he began talking about it in what was his only book, um, Notes on the State of Virginia. He um, expressed some feelings in that book that are painful to read today because they, they're so racist, but he also uh, condemned slavery. Um, it's, it's a telling point about the time that he was more concerned that what he said about how awful slavery was and how it needed to be ended forever. He was more concerned about that uh, causing a scandal than he was about anything else he uh, said in, in notes. So from a very uh, early time on, he was talking about the horrors of slavery and he gave us you know, the immortal words that we read on the uh, Jefferson Memorial today. Madison, I felt just as strongly early in his life when he was a young man, he, he dedicated himself to trying to find a way to live without slavery. And he got Monroe to do some investments with him, uh, land speculation really, but they weren't very good businessmen. I mean, Washington was the, the best businessman of all. And their attempt to uh, build themselves a base so that they could uh, lead a life uh, in, in which they did not hold enslaved people, they came to not. And, uh, so Madison was trying as a young man, Monroe trying as a young man. Whom have I left out? Washington. Washington expressed his um, views on slavery, as you might expect from a man who didn't say all that much, um, in, in very limited ways. But it was quite clear that he, uh, he felt that slavery was an unworkable institution and immoral, because at the end of his life, he freed his slaves. Now I couldn't free Martha's slaves. That's an important distinction to make. Um, she had in her dower, uh, the ownership of a number of slaves, 150 or more. And he couldn't sell those because they weren't his to sell. However, he did free the other slaves and his, uh, an amount I think smaller than Martha's. He provided for the education of those slaves he provided for them being able to uh, read and write and uh, for their interning uh, in different professions so they could earn a living. So it was, it was an amazing gesture and one that uh, all too few of his uh, compatriots followed. Is, is it significant that the four founders you talk about all recognized the incompatibility of slavery with morality and natural law and were there others in 
Virginia, for example, even in the Virginia delegation who felt differently? Yes, no, especially in Upper Virginia. Uh, uh, that was um, a belief that was widespread. Uh, later in the uh, 19th century, and particularly in the, the Lower South, the one Virginia as well, there developed uh, a group who chose to stand on the floor of the uh, Congress and argue for the virtues of slavery. Um, it's very painful to read, um, to read the debates, but this was never something that um, the four men I write about participated in. They always uh, agreed that the system into which they had been born was corrupt and immoral and should be ended. That seems significant as we talk about why these founding ideals uh, inspired Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and why they're relevant today. Mm -hmm. Do, what, what, what else would you say to school kids? Of course, this is a very uh, vivid debate in this country today about, about why we should study these founders um, and be inspired by their ideals, uh, despite the fact that they violated them in practice. And, you know, despite the fact that we have taken a long time to make the progress we have, but that the progress in the whole course of human history is, is quite amazing. The thing I worry about most is the uh, cutting down of the ideals uh, that they built upon. There's a, a project um, um, that comes out of the New York Times and is uh, being worked into the curriculum of our schools. And it begins by saying that um, our ideals were lies from the beginning. And that's simply not true. Our ideals uh, were, they are transcendent ideas like liberty and justice, as Jefferson pointed out, uh, can't be taken from any of us. We each possess those internally. And for it to be suggested that we had a corrupt beginning in terms of our ideals really undercuts our national, our national story. It, uh, it implies that uh, the whole effort was uh, corrupt from the beginning. And I hope that there are not many children who are uh, led to think this way. I do worry uh, as I watch demonstrators and protesters when I see people saying, you know, this country was corrupt from the beginning, because that implies that uh, getting rid of it would be a good idea. And I think you just uh, began to answer that question, but what, what is your response to those who say the country is uh, corrupt from the beginning. What do, uh, you, would, would you point to the preamble to the declaration as expressing the ideals that uh, Americans should do and should continue to embrace today? Our founding documents, uh, surely, uh, declaration, the constitution, the bill of rights, uh, those contain the ideals that became the great weapons against slavery that um, I talked about before. Um, I, I, it's just wrong to talk about uh, the ideals on which we were founded being corrupt. Now, there was, uh, as I have said, an enormous contradiction between those ideals and uh, the fact that these men were slaveholders. I've, Gordon Wood is a wonderful historian, um, writes in one of his books that, uh, you know, this, this is a, a real puzzle, a real contradiction but that he's certainly glad they made the decision they did to start a country based on ideals uh, to do something such as the world had never been seen before. And, and I, uh, I find some comfort in that idea as well. Very powerful. Ken Moskovich asks, regarding slavery, how did the four react or participate in the passage of the Northwest Ordinance, which prevents slavery in the territories? Uh, Jefferson was the main participant there. He um, made a proposal that there uh, should be no slavery. Sh slavery should be forbidden in the Northwest Territory. Now his proposal didn't go anyplace, but after he had gone to Paris, something very similar to it, a model uh, of his proposal, uh, a proposal based on his model, um, did become law. 
And it was one indication of Jefferson early on in his life acting against slavery. It was still a time, I think, when people believed that slavery might go away on its own. That Jefferson had another emancipation project too, but uh, there simply wasn't the widespread support for it that uh, he had hoped. And slavery became ever more entrenched in the South as, uh, as time went on. Beth Elstein asked why and when did Madison change from being a Federalist to a Republican? Well, I'm not sure he ever thought of himself as a Federalist, so I can see why uh, one might be tempted to call him that. They basically just thought of themselves as uh, elite Americans creating a society that would benefit everyone. But when Madison and Jefferson saw what they thought uh, to be Washington's kingly tendencies. They, they believed that uh, he would drag us backward to where we had been before the, uh, before the revolution and split off at that point. Um, I, I think before they just thought of themselves as one thing, but then there was the split and uh, Madison and Jefferson created what uh, became known as, but we should be careful to point out, is not related to the Republican Party, the Republican Party of today. We have a uh, question, uh, which is uh, from J.T. Shem, who says, Jefferson once said something like blind adherence to the Constitution jeopardizes its very existence and its folly, and asked if we could provide the exact quote, and I, Think of the famous one about the earth belonging to the living and uh, Jefferson's skepticism that one generation should be bind, able to bind another's and certainly his far greater receptivity to another convention than Madison who thought it would be a disaster because it was a miracle the first one succeeds. But does, does that quotation ring any bells and what, are your, what light can you cast on Jefferson's views about blind adherence to the constitution being folly? Well, it sounds as though Jefferson might have said something like that and uh, meant it in the moment and probably uh, meant it for a longer time. But his mind went in so many directions and uh, the particular letter to Madison that you're talking about has become very famous. The idea that the earth belongs to the living and we shouldn't have to pay debts that are older than 19 years. We shouldn't have constitutions that were older than 19 years. He, he deemed that to be the length of time we should count as a, as a generation. Uh, it was one of those fantasies that he had that Madison pointed out in very kind, but matter of fact ways, he, he pointed out the flaws in such an idea. How, how could you have a new constitution every 19 years? You would throw the country in, into chaos. So I, I'm not sure how to answer your, uh, the question asked. I, I don't know the exact quote that, uh, that your uh, questioner is, is thinking about. We, I've now found a, a series of quotations from Jefferson on uh, the need for amendments and, and how the earth belongs to the living and so forth. And he, uh, said, let us provide in our constitution for its revision at stated periods. And as you suggested, he said, a majority will be dead at 19 years. And at that point, a new majority should come into place. Was he systematic about how it was supposed to work? Were people supposed to exercise the unalienable natural right to alter and abolish government and just start from scratch? Or how, how were the new constitution supposed to arise? Well, he was not a detail man. <laughs> uh, he was a concept man. And among the faults that Madison pointed out to his theory was that generations, even if you want to say they last 19 years, that a single one does, even if you want to say that, they don't all depart the stage at the same time. It's not as though after 19 years, everyone who was involved in the beginning just departs from the political stage. So it was an unworkable plan. Um, Jefferson himself uh, was being pressed to repay debts at that time. He led a very precarious financial uh, life. And, and one wonders if this personal didn't enter into it too. As, as I've said before, it's almost impossible to, uh, to explain all of the complexity uh, of a single person's decision. At the end of his life, 
Jefferson was questioning the institution of judicial review, based in part of his dislike for his distant cousin, John Marshall, and also talking about the possibility of secession. But William Paul asked squarely, do you think the Virginia Four ever contemplated a future civil war to be fought over slavery? No, I don't. And I think it was uh, Jefferson uh, speaking in, in what uh, Madison called his fully rounded way. Um, Jefferson speaking in that tone when he suggested that states should have um, the right to uh, turn down, uh, uh, divorce themselves from uh, a federal uh, decision. Madison was much more temperate as one would expect on, on the topic. But that uh, paper that Jefferson wrote uh, caused the uh, idea of secession to take on a prominence that uh, it never lost. Um, our Constitution Center friends know that I, I back to, in law school, I had a debate with my dear teacher and, and friend Akil Amar about whether mm -hmm. at the time of the convention, there was a consensus that we, the people of the United States as a whole were sovereign and therefore that secession was unconstitutional as James Wilson and Lincoln claimed, or whether there was a debate and some felt that we, the people of the states were sovereign and therefore secession was at least uh, constitutionally permissible. Do, do you think it was settled at the time of the founding or was there a debate on that question? No, there really wasn't to, to my knowledge, though uh, uh, you and your peer probably more, uh, well, better read than I in that. It, it became an issue as the South became more and more concerned that the federal government would abolish slavery. Uh, that went so at the uh, heart of the economic system of the South that uh, the idea of secession uh, became ever more appealing. And as I say, as slavery became more entrenched and uh, people did not see how the South could survive without it, um, that in itself caused uh, a reaction in the North, um, which was abolitionist. It was a terrible idea and a terrible uh, trend that we had set ourselves on, but slavery made it inevitable. We, we, sh we shouldn't uh, part without a, a beat on Monroe, who of course will be less familiar to our viewers than the other founders. You, you note that Monroe, along with Madison, at the end of his life became a leader in the American Colonization Society, which encouraged emancipation by underwriting the transportation of free people to Liberia. Um, but in addition to the Monroe Doctrine, um, what should we know about James Monroe? That he was a good president. He uh, had been, uh, you know, a, a painfully hungry after uh, success for most of his life, but. Once he had held the many high offices he did, his, his resume was uh, very impressive. He was Secretary of War and Secretary of State at the same time at one point. Um, after going through all of those experiences in high office, he'd learned how to be a good president. He'd, he'd watched it in action. He wasn't afraid of uh, having people around him who were smarter than he was. Uh, John Quincy Adams being a case in point, People say, and with some truth, that uh, John Quincy Adams was uh, in large part responsible for the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, Quincy Adams never said that himself. He was a good Secretary of State um, who didn't run around uh, claiming credit for ideas, even if he'd had a, a large part in creating them. So Monroe kept a good cabinet around him. It was a stable cabinet. Um, it was a time that's sometimes been called uh, the uh, era of peace. This is a time when the United States was at ease and at peace. And there is some truth in that, though people have uh, debunked that idea forever. There was some truth that this was an era of good feelings. So Monroe, in the end, was a good president. He was. Uh, uh, also, he, he and Madison, amazingly, were the two uh, who left office happy, Madison particularly. Um, Washington's second term was so awful uh, 
that he couldn't get back to Mount Vernon fast enough. And Jefferson felt the same. He felt as though he had been uh, insulted, uh, uh, torn about by the media. He, of course, was a champion of free speech, but uh, toward the end of his life, he wrote to a young man uh, who'd asked him about uh, the press, about newspapers. And I think the young man was not prepared for the answer he got. Jefferson wrote back and said, you know, newspapers might not be as bad as they are if they would just set aside a section in the newspaper for lies. And I'm, I'm sure when the young man got that letter back from the former president, he was quite astonished. But it, Jefferson left office an unhappy man. Madison and Monroe, much less so. Leaving the office happy and presiding over an era of good feeling is indeed a enviable uh, legacy for both. Uh, Fred Sutherland, our great friend at the Constitution Center, asks, wasn't the three-fifths compromise and the provision for the elimination of the future importation of slaves also evidence that Madison and Jefferson decided that ignoring slavery was the only way to get the Constitution ratified and that slavery would best be eliminated over time? The uh, uh, three-fifths compromise, uh, which has... Um, been the source of, of so much anger uh, and so much angst. I totally understand why. Uh, it was less, how shall I say, astonishing at the time. This was the same ratio that was used uh, to establish a tax assessment. You know, if you counted uh, the whole population that was free plus three fifths of the population that was slave, that determined your tax assessment. So when it came time to figure out uh, how you apportioned the Congress, uh, the same uh, the same figure came came into play. The way that it was expressed uh, does indeed uh, point out their effort to keep the Constitution neutral, to not have the con Constitution be a slave document in any way. Instead of saying three-fifths of all enslaved persons, it says three-fifths of all other persons. And I have a, I had a wonderful friend named uh, Bob Goldwyn, who once wrote, and I thought this was a astonishing, an astonishing way to look at it, that the founders, as uh, they participated in writing um, the Constitution, were preparing for a society better than their own. They didn't want to recreate what they saw as the largest flaw in their society. And so the word slave, slavery is never mentioned in the constitution. Neither, neither um, is the word woman ever mentioned in the constitution. I think that's uh, telling and uh, telling in the sense that I don't think they thought the oppression of women was, uh, and they were correct was uh, nearly as violent and harsh as slavery was. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, of course, used to talk about how the Constitution, she believed the founders hoped that it would become ever more embracive, which was her word, to include oh, that's nice. previously excluded groups. Uh, mm -hmm. Concluding thoughts, we, we, several versions of this question, but uh, given the current political divisiveness, James Griffin asks, are we forgetting the enlightened founding ideals at a point where we'll no longer keep the Republic or does studying history make you optimistic that we will transcend our current fixations? Well, history gives you hope because we have come through so much in our past. Um, on the other hand, watching the current situation where the idea that the United States has been uh, corrupt and criminal from the beginning uh, is ever more widely accepted and indeed is becoming part of the uh, curricula taught in our schools if the New York Times project goes ahead as it, uh, as it was originally presented. That idea is just terrifying to me. You know, why, why would you become a supporter of a country that had been corrupt from the beginning? So that's what terrifies me. And uh, I just hope that uh, if our schools aren't doing a good enough job of uh, telling those ideas, of making uh, young people understand those ideas, 
then parents and grandparents will uh, take on the task. Sometimes you uh, can't depend upon institutions, but you can't always uh, depend upon yourself. Very well said. And the National Constitution Center uh, stands by to help those parents and grandparents with our live classes, with our wonderful educational materials, and with this beautiful interactive constitution, which brings together liberals and conservatives to debate what unites and uh, divides us about these great founding documents that ultimately continue to constitute the essence of we the people. Lynn Cheney, these conversations are always so meaningful and enlightening. Thank you so much for this one. And I can't wait for your next book so you can come back and discuss it with us very soon. Well, thank you. I can't imagine a, a, somebody just set off the alarm. Uh, I can't sure. imagine a, a more delightful uh, way to spend an hour. And thank you for letting me talk about my book and my favorite subjects. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Good night.